One of the most frustrating things about dealing with a narcissistic relationship is all of the confusing, conflicting, mixed messages that you get. Just when you think that you've accomplished some sort of communication, just when you think that you've got things figured out, they say something that completely contradicts or completely upends something that they've been saying for years maybe. It's so hard to figure out what it is they actually want and why they're actually angry. In today's video, I'm going to talk about different types of these mixed messages and what it is they actually mean. Welcome to Looking Behind the Mirror, where we explore narcissism and take our lives back as we make sense out of nonsense. As a quick disclaimer, everything I say is based on my opinions and my personal experiences. I'm not a professional, and if you're really struggling, I encourage you to seek professional help. I am providing links below for you. First, some examples of what I mean by this. I think it's really common for narcissists to do things like tell you that they wish that you would spend more time with them and complain about that. But then when you do try to spend time with them, they get annoyed with you and tell you that you're being clingy and that they need some space. I remember I had a narcissist in my life who started telling me how boring I was and that I never wanted to do anything fun. And so I went to some real effort to try to come up with some ideas of some fun things we could do together. And when I presented them, it was like he wasn't the least bit interested at all. And it was really confusing. Like, I thought you wanted to do some fun things together, but like, you don't seem at all interested. Or he didn't even seem to make the connection that I was trying to do the thing that he was complaining I didn't do. Maybe a narcissist will harass you to do something that you really don't want to do and they just won't let it go and it'll go on and on for months. And so when you finally do this thing that they really, really want you to do, it's like they don't even notice that you did it or you didn't do it right or whatever. You think that they're finally going to be satisfied. They're finally going to be happy with this thing that they've been telling you to do, that they've been telling you that they want you to do so bad. But then when you finally do it, it's like it doesn't mean anything to them anymore. It's really confusing. They can do this in indirect ways as well. When you're trying to figure out how to make this person happy, sometimes you can become quite preoccupied looking for clues. So maybe one day this person says something about how much they love flowers, or maybe you remember them saying this at some point, going on about how much they love flowers. So you buy them flowers but then they complain about how much they don't like flowers. and Or maybe they complain about how much it bothers them when other people do X, Y, or Z, and or they talk about how much they love it when other people do X, Y, or Z. And so you take that as a, a clue of like, oh, if I do that thing or if I don't do that thing, then they're going to like that. That's what they like, right? Like maybe they complain that they don't like it when people dye their hair that that's like fake or something. And so you think, okay, I better not dye my hair because they're not gonna like it if I dye my hair. But then they start criticizing you for going gray, that, that you're not dyeing your hair. And it's like, okay, I thought you didn't like it when people dyed their hair. Maybe they talk about how much they admire so-and-so for going back to school. And when you try to go back to school, they criticize you and tell you it's a waste of time. Now, as a quick side note, if you haven't already caught on to this, I just want to point out that a lot of these themes are about sacrificing our own needs, ignoring our own preferences and what we want out of our own lives in an attempt to make someone else happy and in an attempt to be what that other person wants. That's not really the topic of today's video, but I think it's food for thought for anybody who's lost in this kind of maze in their relationship. It's one thing to talk important decisions over with your partner. It's one thing to consider their opinion when you're making your own decisions. It's another when you are altering what you want out of life, when you are changing who you are and how you want to express yourself in an attempt to find acceptance in a relationship with somebody who isn't happy with you the way you are, who isn't happy with you if you do the things that that you will really find fulfilling in your life. So I just want to point that out. You shouldn't have to sacrifice your happiness in order to be acceptable to somebody who's supposed to love you. Now, when you're in this type of relationship where you don't know which way is up, you don't know 
if what you're about to do is going to make this person in your life happy or if it's going to make them really angry and you're just constantly trying to guess, trying to read this person's mind, it can really give you this chronic feeling of instability, unpredictability, walking on eggshells, hypervigilance, constantly paying attention to every little thing, overanalyzing everything, trying to figure out if this is a good thing or a bad thing, trying to predict the future. And I think it really ends up giving you this feeling that you don't have any control over your own life, especially when you've become somebody who's very focused on uh, making somebody else happy, on managing somebody else's mood. And to you, that is control. When you can't control this other person's mood, you feel such distress that you feel like you don't have control over your own life. You're lost in this constant attempt to solve this puzzle that you just can't quite figure out. So how can you figure out what a narcissist actually wants from you? You need to really completely abandon all of these assumptions that you're making as you're trying to solve this puzzle. You're assuming a lot. You're assuming that the narcissist perceives the world in a somewhat similar way to the way you do. You're assuming that the narcissist has permanent stable preferences. Narcissists don't have a stable, permanent feeling of self-identity. They don't have any real values or standards that have any roots or foundation to them. Their moods, their feelings, their preferences, their opinions are extremely transient, very much written in disappearing ink. They are blowing in the wind, just changing with their mood. What they felt five minutes ago could be completely different from what they feel now. And they're almost not even aware of this as their mood changes because as their mood changes, their reality changes completely. Now, maybe they really are aware that they hate tomatoes. <laughs> maybe that's something really consistent with them. I, I do notice with some of the people I've known in my life that I consider very narcissistic, there are things that seem consistent, like hating tomatoes or, or whatever, or opinions that they have, very strong opinions. But I think even those can be a lot more variable than you would think. But of all the things that narcissists are constantly changing their minds about, I think one thing that really affects us and our relationships with them is how their opinions of other people are very impermanent, are constantly changing with their moods. Even people that they seem to have some kind of vendetta against, somebody that's really offended them that they quote hate, or maybe they go on and on about how much they can't stand this person. Even those types of opinions that seem very stable, I've seen them change with the wind. I, I mentioned this story before on this channel, but I was close with a very narcissistic person at one point who went into business with his friend and this business did not do well at all. And he spent um, a good, at least a year, constantly complaining about how this friend had uh, taken advantage of him, lied to him, not done his fair share of the work, basically blaming the failure of this business completely on his friend and how his friend had screwed him over. And I mean, he spent a lot of time complaining about this. And then, I don't know, a couple years down the road, he suddenly had this business idea, this new business idea, right? And he just non-ironically, just in all seriousness, suggested, hmm, I wonder if my friend could help me out with this part of this business. And I was like, what? After all that time and energy you spent complaining about how much you couldn't stand what this person did to you and how horrible this person was, you're just gonna go right back into business with him? But I think this is a good example of how when the mood shifts, when the perception shifts, when the fantasy world turns, all reality changes and nothing that happened yesterday means anything anymore, no matter how important it might have seemed at one point. Nothing is really important, except a few things, which are the ability to control their life and the lives of others, their ability to control everything, basically their feeling of relevance, their ability to convince themselves that they are the only person who really matters, that they are 
so extremely important that the whole world exists just for them and everything should just be all about them. So their feeling of relevance, their ability to control everybody, their feeling of entitlement, which feeds into their feeling of relevance. So they feel entitled to anything and everything they could ever want. They feel like it should just be theirs and they feel like they should be blameless, be held blameless and innocent for anything they do. In fact, not just blameless, but the victim. Like in the story I just told about this narcissistic person whose friend totally screwed him over in this business venture that failed, you know? This narcissistic person I knew took zero accountability, even though I was there. And, you know, if I'm being honest, like he wasn't exactly um, working around the clock trying to make this business work. If I remember correctly, he did almost nothing <laughs> to try to get this business off the ground, but he, bl he put all the blame on his friends so that he wouldn't have to take any. So blamelessness is very, very important. These things don't change. These things remain important at all times to a narcissist. These things you can count on. These things aren't gonna contradict themselves. So control, relevance, blamelessness, and entitlement. If you remember that, everything else can start to make a little more sense when they contradict themselves and when they seem to be sending you mixed messages. And these values of control and relevance and entitlement and blamelessness are part of this perception they have of their reality. They aren't based on actual reality. It's based on their mood. They interpret reality through their emotions. So it doesn't really matter if they're in control of their world, if they're in control of other people. It matters if they feel like they're in control of other people and if they feel like they're in control of the world. It matters if they feel like they're the most important person or the only important person in the world. It doesn't matter, obviously it doesn't matter if they actually are the only important person in the world. And it doesn't matter if they actually are entitled to anything and everything they want. It matters if they feel that way, if they feel like they're blameless, they feel like they're actually the victim. And the reason this is so important to remember when you're trying to understand what it is they want is because these feelings change with their mood. So this is why one day they might really love a bouquet of flowers and the next day they hate them because their mood changed. And with that, their reality changed. And with that, their feelings of control and relevance and blamelessness changed. And, and so that's why they honestly hate the flowers today and they honestly loved them yesterday. It isn't about whether or not they actually like flowers or not. They're so out of touch with who they really are and what they really like and what they really think that none of that, even if it exists, it doesn't really matter. Even if they truly do have an opinion about how they feel about flowers, their ego, their insecurities, their mood completely overrides any authentic feelings or preferences they actually have. So while you're trying to figure out, do they like flowers or do they not like flowers? The real question is, what kind of mood are they in today? If I send them flowers today, are they gonna feel like I'm trying to take advantage of them and manipulate them and make them think I like them? Or if I send them flowers today, are they going to think that I'm paying attention to them and fawning over them? Are they going to enjoy all the attention other people pay to them? Are they gonna enjoy the feeling they have thinking that other people must be jealous of them? It all depends on their mood and you can't predict that. And that's why you can't predict whether or not they're going to like flowers today. Now, another part I wanna talk about with this is a narcissist's complete inability to feel appreciation for anything or anybody. Narcissists are almost 100% incapable of any form of appreciation at all because of their pathological sense of entitlement. Your time, your energy, your resources, basically anything you have to give to them, you just should. You just should give them anything and and anything and everything you possibly could, and then some, if you really cared about them. You just should give everything you've got, and it still won't be enough, but 
they're not going to appreciate it. They're not going to appreciate it any more than you appreciate the cashier at the store giving you your change because that's just what they're supposed to do. I think in a relationship with any type of relationship with anybody, it is perfectly natural and normal for us to crave a little bit of appreciation. When we make those little sacrifices, when we do things for somebody we care about because we want them to be happy or because we want to grow the relationship, we expect that to be recognized on some level. You know, we might not expect to be lavish, lavished with uh, praise, but we assume that it's at least being recognized a little bit, right? Even if nothing's being said, we assume that when we sacrifice little things or big things for the benefit of someone else, that that's going to be noticed. And when we're in a relationship with a narcissist, we can't help but notice over time that a lot of the things that we are giving up are not being appreciated, that our efforts are not good enough most of the time. And when this happens, we have two choices. We can either keep trying to make this person happy, keep trying to find some sort of recognition, appreciation, acknowledgement, or we can say, you know what, this person just doesn't appreciate anything I do, so why bother? I'm not going to keep making little sacrifices for this person. I'm not going to keep doing things I don't really want to do for this person, for the sake of this person, because they don't even notice. They don't care. So why should I sacrifice things that this person doesn't even realize I'm sacrificing, right? But the problem with a narcissistic relationship is even if you are that second type of person that would normally not sit and keep trying to make this person happy that would just say, you know what, screw it. Why should I keep wasting my time, right? If, even if you are that type of person, in a lot of these types of relationships, the narcissist will give you intermittent praise. And you will think that that's appreciation because it looks like appreciation and it's being given in place of appreciation when appreciation would have been appropriate. Intermittent praise from narcissists is like counterfeit appreciation. And when we're in a relationship with someone who doesn't seem to appreciate anything we do, and we suddenly receive something that feels like appreciation, that can feel really good. It can be quite intoxicating. And we can even get sort of addicted in a sense to chasing that appreciation because we know it's there. We know that if we just figure it out, if we just crack the code, we're going to get that praise again, which our brain is interpreting as appreciation. And this can keep us on a hamster wheel for much longer than we would normally stay on it, trying to make this person happy. When in reality, even when this person is offering intermittent praise, they have never at any point, at any time, appreciated anything we've actually done. Narcissists offer intermittent praise as a manipulation tactic. Some of them might not consciously be aware that that's what they're doing. I think some narcissists offer intermittent praise because maybe in the moment it feels good. You know, maybe it just seems like a cool thing to do or the right thing to do to say, oh, thank you so much. You're so sweet. You know, maybe that just makes them feel like they're a nice person. And so they don't really think about how inconsistent they are if they're in a bad mood and they complain about exactly the same thing they were praising you for yesterday. Like I said, their reality changes with their mood and I don't think that they're always aware of this, but it doesn't really matter because the results are always the same at the end of the day. Intermittent praise is extremely manipulative and it disguises itself as appreciation, which is something that we all need in relationships, which is something that if we're not getting enough of, we are really, really going to crave. And we're going to keep chasing and trying to figure out what it is we need to do to be appreciated. Because it hurts when we give up something, when we give little sacrifices or big ones, and we don't get any acknowledgement in return and we're not appreciated in any way and especially when we're blaming ourselves we're, we're assuming that we must have gotten something wrong we must have done something not quite the right way and if we can just figure it out we can get it right one more story i remember um with an extremely narcissistic person that i was in a romantic relationship with he got this idea at some point that he was going to invent something. And without going into details, I mean, it was 
looking back, it was a pretty harebrained idea that never really made any coherent sense. But he was very, very fixated on this idea. And I've told this story on the channel before, in case it sounds familiar. But I remember um, he spent months talking about this for hours every time we spent time together. He would spend hours talking about this idea. It was exhausting. I was not enjoying it, but I wanted to be supportive. And so I just sat there and listened to him go on and on and on. And of course, I never thought about the fact that he had absolutely zero consideration for how bored out of my mind I was or how like painful this was almost to spend all this time listening to him talk about something that I really didn't care about. But I was trying to be supportive. And like I said, this went on for months and then it kind of stopped for a while. And then maybe, I don't know, a couple seasons later, it started up again. And all in all, I'm sure I spent at least a hundred hours just sitting there listening to him talk about something that didn't even really make any sense. And I assumed, even though he never expressed it, I assumed that he appreciated it. I assumed that I was showing him how important he was to me. I assumed that I was being supportive and that he would see that. But there was one day he was mad about something, which was not unusual. And he started yelling at me about how unsupportive I was. And I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he was talking specifically about this harebrained invention idea he had. And I remember whatever it was he said, I just remember it dawned on me for the first time after like at least a year of this, that he had zero appreciation for all these hours I had spent sitting there listening to him. Like it meant nothing to him. Not only did it mean nothing to him, he was sitting here yelling at me for being unsupportive. And I just remember just, it, it was such a terrible feeling of, of realizing that I had wasted all this time listening to him. I mean, really bored, uncomfortable. I did not enjoy this at all. And, and to realize that it meant nothing, that all of this effort was just flushed down a toilet. And not only did it mean nothing, but I was being yelled at now for being unsupportive. So I might as well have just not listened to him in the first place about anything because it 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 was just purely wasted time, 100%. I remember how shocking that was. Just the biggest slap in the face. And it didn't happen right away. Like I said, I had invested, I mean, at least 100 hours over the course of over a year of this idea before it dawned on me, wow, he doesn't appreciate it one bit. Not, not even, he's actually angry at me for not being supportive enough. And I know that's a little off the topic from the topic of this video, which is the mixed messages and the contradicting um, instructions we get from narcissists. But I think it all ties together with how we're really chasing after appreciation or recognition for the ways that we're trying to express our love and support uh, to this person who just can't see any of it if they're not in the mood to see it. So if this is something you're struggling with, I think what's really important to understand, as I said in the beginning of the video, you shouldn't have to sacrifice who you are. You shouldn't have to go through hours and hours of excruciating boredom for somebody who never even acknowledges that that's what you're doing. Somebody who feels entitled to it. You shouldn't have to change your personal habits in order to be accepted and loved by somebody else. You shouldn't have to change important life decisions in order to receive love and acceptance by somebody else. You should be able to be yourself and, and you should have your sacrifices at least acknowledged in some way when, when they're given out of love and when they're, they're given for the good of somebody else and the good of a relationship. It's also really important to understand that you are not responsible for reading somebody else's mind. It's not your job to try to guess what someone wants from you. I know it can certainly feel like that when we're trying to prevent a tantrum when we're walking on eggshells, we're trying to keep ourselves safe. But even this is really based on an illusion because 
in the example I just gave, I spent hours and hours and hours trying to make this person happy. Part of it was out of fear because I knew that if I didn't sit there and listen to this person go on and on about their crazy idea, they were going to get really angry with me. So part of me was trying to keep the peace, right? But in the end, maybe in the moment, I was able to keep the peace by just sitting there listening, right? But in the end, I ended up dealing with a tantrum anyway. He was yelling and screaming at me about how unsupportive I was anyway. All that effort that I went to didn't end up saving me from a tantrum. It didn't end up keeping me safe. So trying to read someone's mind, walk on eggshells, be hyper vigilant, trying so hard to control something you have no control over is not your job and it really can't be done. Grown adults will tell you what they want and they will be honest with you when there are certain things they'd rather you not do. And they really aren't gonna sit and change their mind back and forth. And if they do change their mind back and forth, they'll acknowledge that and maybe try to explain it to you. The burden isn't on you to try to predict what somebody is going to want tomorrow. The burden is on them to communicate that to you. And it isn't your job to figure out what somebody means, what somebody wants when they can't or won't communicate in a coherent way. When they say things that don't make any sense, when they give instructions that don't make any sense or conflict with each other, it isn't your job to figure out what they mean when no matter how hard you try, nothing they are, they are saying makes any sense to you. It's their job to express themselves in a way that can be understood. And in the same vein, it isn't your job to force somebody to make sense. I mean, of course, we're all going to at least make an attempt to communicate when there's a misunderstanding, right? I mean, if somebody says something that doesn't make any sense, it's just, it's just common courtesy to give them a chance to explain, oh, what did you mean by that? But when no matter what you do, nothing they say is making any more sense to you, there's a point where it's just not your job to force them to make sense or to force them to say something coherent. And it's not your fault if what they're telling you doesn't make any sense or is impossible or is something that you can't do. It's not your fault when you can't understand the instructions that are coming from somebody who can't or won't communicate. It's also not your job to figure out what somebody means when they say something and you're wondering if they actually mean something else. So with the flower example, if somebody says, oh, I really love flowers, I would really like it if you gave me flowers for my birthday. It's not your job to sit and wonder, is that what they really meant? Do they really want flowers for their birthday or did they actually mean that they want chocolate or whatever? If that's what they said to you, it's not your job to try to interpret that some other way. It's not your job to read their mind. Grown adults have to live with the consequences of what they have told people. So even in, in an example that's probably a little more common, even with people that aren't necessarily narcissistic, if somebody says, for example, oh, don't get me anything for my birthday. I don't need any presents. You know, some of us are gonna get something anyway, like, and we're gonna try to read their mind and try to guess what they might want. But really in reality, if somebody tells you, don't get me anything for my birthday, that's all, you can only take them at face value. It's not your job to reinterpret what they said. It's their job to communicate what they actually mean and what they actually want. And if that's what they actually said, that's really all that you can do is take them at their word and, and go by what they have told you. And if they wanted something different, it's it's on them. It's their responsibility to communicate that. It's not your responsibility to figure it out. Narcissists will put this burden on you because of how important blamelessness is on them. So when they say things that contradict each other, it's completely their fault that you can't understand what it is they want, but they have to try to make it your fault. And if you spend a lot of time with narcissists or in narcissistic relationships, you can be completely convinced that it is your job to read other people's minds and predict the future and figure out if somebody really meant what they said and that that is your job and that you should be held accountable for not reading other people's minds. But, but really, 
narcissists are never satisfied because narcissists are never really happy with anything. Maybe for fleeting moments, they are in a good mood. I mean, that definitely happens. But then that feeling comes right back. Those feelings of insecurity, those feelings of not really having control over their own lives, of not really being good enough for anybody, and those feelings of mistrust, those feelings that, that tell them that you're probably just lying to them, you're probably just taking advantage of them. Those emotions that control their perception of reality are always going to come back and always going to make everything and anything not good enough. You can never be good enough for a narcissist until they decide to deal with their own emotions and take accountability of their own problems, which almost none of them are ever going to be willing to do. But it is not your job to manage and predict the expectations of somebody who is never going to be satisfied with anything. I hope this helps. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and comment below any ideas you have for me for future videos. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like this video and would like to see more like it in the future. Until next time, thanks, bye.